by a massive ball of flames. A NASA rocket exploded shortly after liftoff on Tuesday evening, lighting up the sky above eastern Virginia. Bound for the International Space Station, the rocket was unmanned and no injuries were reported, as Claire Williams explains. And we have liftoff of Antares, the Dwarf 3 mission, covering Cygnus on its third CRS mission to the ISS. Six seconds after liftoff, the Antares rocket explodes and a massive fireball crashes to the ground. And launch team, launch team, be advised, stay at your consoles. Everyone in the LCC, maintain your positions in your consoles. The unmanned mission, known as CRS-3, launched from the Wallops pad in Virginia State. The Cygnus craft is owned by Orbital Sciences Corporation and was carrying supplies to crew members at the International Space Station. A mishap has occurred at Pad 0A. We have lost the Orb 3 vehicle. At this point, it appears that the damage is limited to the facility. There's no indication that there are personnel uh, in danger, although we do have significant property damage and significant vehicle damage. It was due to lift off on Monday evening but the launch was delayed because a boat entered the hazard area. The U.S. space shuttle program ended in 2011, taking away government funds to send humans into space. This is the first major accident since private companies like Orbital stepped in to fill the gap. Orbital has a $1.9 billion contract with NASA for a total of eight supply missions. Americans on the East Coast staring at the sky at 6.22 p.m. Eastern Time may well have been able to spot the streak of light. That's it for now. More news coming up here on France 24. Do stay tuned. and welcome to Encore. In today's art special, we meet the man who's nurtured and defended some of the biggest names in contemporary art for three decades now. If the walls of Tadeus Ropax galleries could talk, they'd tell us about Jean-Michel Bastiat, Joseph Beuys, Gilbert and George, and many, many more. We'll be asking him about the market and the monumental artworks he's bought and sold. Let's go and meet our guest. Today, so Rofak, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Well, just to start off, I'd like to uh, introduce my guest briefly. With galleries in Salzburg, Paris, and now Pontin on the outskirts of Paris, he's one of the most established gallerists on the European art scene, with a job that sees him negotiating the sale of a Gerhard Richter masterpiece one day and overseeing a new show by an up-and-coming artist the next. Now, we uh, actually were at uh, the FIAC, of course, where your stand was. And what I wanted to ask you is that these days we're in the season of festivals, the freeze, the FIAC. Is it really important to be present at such a large forum? I should imagine your clients can also have a private appointment or contact you over the phone. Well, the art world became so big and, um, you know, there are many centres in art, which is London and Paris, of course, there's New York, but of course there are the new markets, Hong Kong and uh, Latin America, the Middle East. Um, all these places now are looking for art, for contemporary art. They want to learn, they want to see. Um, there are many more players than there used to be and um, collectors would like to go to certain places where they have the chance to see a lot in a very short time and therefore these fairs are very important and uh, it's important to be there, to be present, to show your artist, to present them and to get the chance to meet all these collectors. But He tends to fall in love with the pieces he invests in and how he's wary of trends. I don't know if you really are a collector, if you buy an artwork and you sell it a year after buying it. It's really, collecting is really meaning accumulating and living with a lot of artwork. Uh, people now look at the California art scene a lot. It's really uh, trendy. Uh, 
doesn't mean that it's not interesting at all, <laughs> of course. But uh, as you focus on a scene, you always forget something that can be really interesting happening uh, elsewhere. And what I do is that I try always to look elsewhere. Well, we know that the recession hasn't affected the art market as badly as it could have done. But do you think that collectors can afford to be like Joseph, buy according to their tastes? Or do you see collectors being a bit strategic given the economic climate? I think you have every kind of collector in today's art world. It's, um, it became such a diverse market also. So there are collectors who really want only masterpieces and some who really have their own museum in mind and uh, buying you know, very clearly in this direction. Then you have like passionate collectors who learn a lot about the new art scenes and younger artists and uh, this is maybe more according to their budget. Um, I think we never have seen such a diverse market um, in the art world uh, where everybody has its place and of course the new markets are changing a lot you know uh, of course we all speak about China and um, Chinese collectors are learning very fast they're really there um, to understand European art but they also want to kind of introduce their own artists to the uh, to their own collecting but also to the world to the Western world to Europe and America and we should not forget the Middle East you know is uh, some of the most incredible museums are built uh, at the moment in Abu Dhabi, um, the Guggenheim Museum is present. France is very strong with mm. the Louvre, also doing a contemporary program. So contemporary art is also uh, the art of the moment. People mm. want to, you know, show and have and own the work mm -hmm. of artists who live at the moment. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, we haven't seen this kind of diversity in taste, but also in focus and in, in motivation than I think ever before. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing this for quite a while, so I should imagine that the way you buy and collect and sell has changed over, over the last few decades. Or do you work with a strategy or do you just fall in love with a piece or an artist? You know, I've seen this world changing so tremendously. Um, I always say 30 years ago, the art world was in its ivory tower. It's very, very elitist. You know, it was very small. Mm. It was very intellectual. And it was very difficult to get into it. And it moved from this ivory tower into the center of life. Today, you know, everybody wants to be surrounded by contemporary art. And if I speak to younger people today, it's fascinating that contemporary art is part of their life. It, you cannot exclude it anymore. So um, you cannot have just one idea how to run a gallery. This idea has constantly changed and evolved. and adapt to the spirit of our time and what collectors expect and what an audience, a general audience. You know, it's not only that we are doing exhibitions to sell art. We really want to um, make the art of the artist who trust us their work, uh, make it understandable to create an audience who just enjoys to look at this art, especially mm -hmm. this new gallery I opened in Pantin, which is very large, it's eight buildings. And, um, and so we really think of doing exhibitions for an audience, mm -hmm. and not only for a buying audience, which of course is important and we take care of those too. Um, but I think that's what is so exciting of today, that it did change so much that we are able to um, create an atmosphere of an exciting audience who just come and enjoy the art, but also to nurture the artist by introducing them to the important collectors who start collections, to museum, uh, directors to curators. Mm -hmm. it's, it's well, you matter. mentioned the uh, ex the exhibition space in Pantin, which is a suburb of Paris. Now, this is a very, very large space. Paris was the second city.